And welcome to another live session for the online astronomy class. It's the end of the semester here at the University of Arizona. We're graduating a thousand students in the College of Science tomorrow. I get to be the MC. That's going to be a lot of fun. And it's pushing 100 degrees here. So it's quite, quite an experience for all those people from out of state who are not used to Arizona in May. Um, the floor is open for your questions. All right, uh, the first live question is from uh, one of our viewers uh, who asks, with billions of stars in the universe, why is space still a dark place or seems dark if looking from the Earth? Yeah, it's a good question uh, and was the basis of one of the more simple and profound questions in astronomy history, which is why is the sky dark at night? Uh, and it's it was turned into Olber's paradox. It, Olber's was not the first the German astronomer from the 19th, I think early 19th century. He was actually not the first astronomer to comment on this idea, but it became attached to him. So the general uh, principle uh, from Newtonian understanding of an infinite universe is that if the number of stars in the universe is infinite and the, num the light from each of the stars goes down as the square of the distance, the number of stars out to any distance goes up as the square of the distance. So the amount of light from each star is going down at the same rate as the number of stars is going up. And so just conceptually from those two facts, you can see that um, the total amount of light should just add up to be infinite in an infinite universe. So that in simple terms, it can be framed different ways as Olber's paradox. Uh, and so, yes, with the, so many stars in the universe, the darkness of the sky or the darkness of the universe is an interesting question. And the modern answer to Albert's paradox or to why the sky is dark at night uh, involves several, several ingredients. Uh, one of them is the fact that the universe is expanding. So uh, the island universe is galaxies that are filled with the starlight are separated by gulfs of space. And those gulfs of space are uh, increasing over time. Um, and in the simple terms, it means there hasn't been time in the history of the universe for light to fill all the spaces between galaxies. That's the extragalactic universe. In addition, the expansion of the universe corresponds to the stretching of space time, which decreases, or sorry, increases the wavelength, decreases the energy of all the photons that travel through space. So as light is leaving stars and galaxies, uh, its energy is being diminished as it travels through space. So again, that means the expectation that the universe is filled with starlight uh, is going against the fact that that energy is diminishing as the universe expands. So those two facts pretty much explain Olber's paradox and the fact that the universe is actually dark rather than being lit by stars. All right, uh, the next question is from one of our live viewers who asks, why do white dwarf stars not appear more in the news? So I guess, why do we not hear more about them, considering that there are billions of them out there? Right, they're the most ubiquitous form of star. So um, white dwarfs are, are interesting. There are, it's a research specialty in astronomy, and there are people who spend their whole careers on white dwarfs. So they're definitely still interesting in terms of astrophysics research. And they are the... A uh, very ubiquitous form of star because stars that are uh, like the mass of the sun, the sun is going to die and leave behind a white dwarf. So, uh, stars that range up to a couple of times the mass of the sun will all die as white dwarfs. And since most stars are much less massive than the sun, uh, that's the fate that awaits them. So, the galaxy is our Milky Way galaxy is going to be filled with you know several hundred billion white dwarfs eventually after all the stars die. Um, I guess they don't get their due or their fair share of attention because they're essentially stellar corpses. They're, there's nothing else going on in a white dwarf. A white dwarf represents a place where there's no fusion, where the uh, star has collapsed to a configuration which is supported by uh, degeneracy pressure, which is a sort of quantum effect where no two particles can have the same set of quantum properties, and that stops the stellar core from further collapsing. And then the star has a temperature, white dwarfs by the name are actually quite hot, tens of, a few tens of thousands of Kelvin, um, will just gradually cool forever. So every white dwarf that currently is white will eventually fade to red and then become invisible as it cools down, radiating its 
remnant energy into space. So their lives are kind of dull and eternal, and there's no pyrotechnics going on. Um, so that's probably why they don't get as much attention as they might. All right, our next question is um, from Erkin, who is on with us live, who asks, will space garbage be a problem for future research um, starting in the near term? And if so, is there anything we can do about it? Space garbage or space junk is, is, is really a huge problem, and there have started to be meetings on this hosted by NASA and other people. Um, basically, as we've continued to put satellites in low Earth orbit um, in now 60 years of telecommunications, uh, and as some of those satellites have fallen apart or been destroyed by impacts with space junk or occasionally have hit each other, um, that low Earth orbital terrain, and by which I mean a couple of hundred miles above the Earth, uh, is starting to be strewn with debris. So it's not just the thousands and thousands of satellites, but it's the millions or billions or trillions of tiny pieces of junk left behind. Um, and there's a problem because when a small piece of debris is moving at speeds of tens of thousands of miles per hour, it carries enormous uh, kinetic energy. Astronauts in the space station, International Space Station, which is in a sort of high, high low Earth orbit of 350 miles, uh, where there's not as much space junk, it's still been the case that pretty much once a year, the astronauts have to take shelter in an interior and heavily shielded part of the space station because the telemetry and the monitoring has shown a small piece of space, small piece of space junk. By small, I mean you know the size of a coin or smaller. Uh, in the vicinity that might hit the space station. It hasn't happened yet. The space station has not suffered a breach. Uh, but it's in a kind of safe higher orbit. The lower Earth orbits are really uh, a big problem of their space debris. So what to do about it? It's a problem that's been around for a while, just steadily getting worse with the increased traffic up there, a bit more rapidly getting worse. Uh, remedies are actually quite difficult because space is mostly empty. E even although there are probabilities of impact that end up being significant, um, an average object is not going to suffer an impact in an average year. So it's a low probability event. And that means the distance between the pieces of space junk that you might want to scoop up or sweep up or to do something with is, is very large. And there are no very efficient ways of vacuuming up, so to speak, that kind of space junk. People have in conceived of various sort of electromagnetic or induction devices since a lot of the debris is metallic so it could respond to a, an induction type approach or an electromagnetic type of scoop um, but these scoops or, or sweeping devices would have to be kilometers across really huge have a huge uh, catch to be able to do any kind of job on this junk and even then it would take decades to clear out so nobody's produced a viable uh, economically viable option that actually will do the job in any reasonable time scale. It's basically a big problem. All right, our next question is from Ilsa, who's on with the slide, who asks, how long does the retrograde motion of Mars take, and has it started already? Um, I'm not actually current on Mars in its present orbit. So, so I just looked it up, and it does start on June 26th and ends on August 27th. OK, great. Matthew's helping me out here. Um, it is starting soon, and it lasts for two months. So that's um, that's the amount of time. That, that corresponds in the orbital dynamics, corresponds to the Earth moving in its faster interior orbit of Mars, sort of approaching Mars on the inside track and passing it on the inside. For that period of time, just a couple of months, or one-sixth of the Earth's orbit, where the Earth is approaching Mars and overtaking it, Mars appears to move backward on the sky. And then when Earth continues in its orbit and Mars continues, they, it resumes its normal motion. So this retrograde pattern happens every couple of years and lasts a couple of months. It was, of course, noted by ancient people because you don't need a telescope to see Mars and you just need to be patient to see retrograde motion. So this was known to the ancients. It wasn't really registered as an issue until the Copernican Revolution, uh, when it became important for people to try and understand how the planets moved. And Mars was an oddball because it appeared to reverse its normal forward motion. 
Uh, Venus and Mercury don't do that, and in fact, only an exterior planet to the Earth can do that. Uh, so Jupiter and Saturn also do that, visible to the naked eye, but these retrograde motions are so subtle uh, that no people were able to observe this until the era of the telescope. All right, our next question from a live viewer is, what um, is the major difference between modern astronomy and old astrology? Have any modern scientists, I think, essentially made any discoveries by studying ancient astrology? Well, astrology uh, goes back several thousand years. Um, there were rudiments of astrology in Babylonia, in Egypt, so cultures that are four to 5,000 years old. Um, in Roman times, it really became a big thing. Romans are very superstitious, and so astrology went, that was actually the first culture where astrology went into the popular culture. For those other ancient civilizations, astrology or divination or trying to foretell the future with positions of things in the sky was done just for kings or the rulers. Everyday people didn't get to talk about or care about astrology. Um, by Roman times, it was still being done for noble people, but it was also being done for common people. So it was like mass market astrology. Uh, the basis for astrology has never existed scientifically, and that hasn't changed in 4,000 years. It's still the idea that the positions, locations of the planets and the objects in the solar system at the time of your birth or at the time you were conceived possibly uh, have an influence on your future life, on perhaps your personality and on maybe on the events in your life. Um, apart from the simplicity of the notion that one in 12 people will share certain attributes or have their actions or uh, things that happen in their lives predictable just by their birth circumstance, that's a pretty implausible premise in science. Um, plenty of studies have shown that astrology simply doesn't work. Uh, I do randomized tests of this in classes when I teach big classes at the University of Arizona and the assignment of events or personalities by supposed star sign is always at the level of random chance or random guessing. So astrology has no valid validity in the realm of science and that doesn't really stop it from being in hundreds of newspapers and thousands of probably tens of thousands of websites. Um, so people, I think, view it as a low stakes belief system where they don't, they're not super invested in it. They're doing it just for recreation or for fun. Um, it does annoy some scientists and many astronomers that astrology is so widely followed in the popular culture, but I don't really think there's anything we can do about it. All right, our next question um, is, why doesn't Mars have a magnetic field? Mars is sort of uh, a small planet, so the first thing is to remember that it's um, it's substantially smaller than the Earth, but larger than the Moon. The Moon also doesn't have a magnetic field. So basically, when uh, small objects form, now the Moon has a particular reason for not having a magnetic field, and that's because it's splashed off the Earth due to an impact. Um, but small objects, when they form, don't have sufficient heavy material, metallic material, in them. Uh, to form a, a, a core. They might have a very small metallic core, but it's not massive enough or hot enough uh, to ever be in a liquid or semi-liquid state. And it's the presence of that core, of a part of that core in a liquid state that causes the inductive buildup of a magnetic field, a differential circulation pattern in that rotating core. Um, so Mars, if it has a core, it's a small core and, and it's not hot enough or big enough to be liquid, and so it's not able to generate or hold a magnetic field. And so the Mars magnetic field is, I think, immeasurably small. All right, our next question uh, from a live viewer is, how can we be sure that gravitational lensing is not doubling the number of stars or galaxies that we see in the universe? So, possible. I mean, a, len a simple lensing geometry does lead to two images where there was only one object. Actually, there's there's always, by the lensing equation, there are actually always an odd number of images. Um, but one of the images tends to be demagnified in the center in the undeviated position. And so we simply don't see that odd numbered image. So typical gravitational lens systems have two images or four or occasionally higher numbers. 
So why hasn't this sort of doubled the number of stars and galaxies? The basic answer is because lensing requires a very particular alignment between some foreground object and some background object. And because stars and galaxies, in terms of their angle, angle on the sky, they both subtend when they're distant galaxies or any kind of star, they subtend angles of a few arc seconds or an arc second. The odds of any foreground object lining up with any background object, given the emptiness of space, are very low. The odds are basically one in a million or one in a few million. In other words, uh, at any given time, given the stars are moving through space in our galaxy, only you'd have to look at millions of stars before you'd happen to find one that was momentarily gravitationally lensed. And the same is true of galaxies in the larger universe. So it's a pretty rare phenomenon. Um, and so it's not going to lead to the doubling of the number of images if only one in a million or so objects is being lensed. All right, um, our next question is about the Hubble Space Telescope. Did the correction for the Hubble Space Telescope mirror completely fix the imperfection or error? Are the pictures now as good as they would be if the mirror was made perfect initially? The short answer is yes. Um, the public relations disaster that happened when the Hubble was launched and the spherical collaboration was discovered was in one respect a little unfair because the way the media presented it was that the Hubble Space Telescope, this multi-billion dollar project, flagship of astronomy, had a crappy mirror, you know, a, a lousily made mirror that was crude and not very precise. Um, that was unfair because actually the Hubble had the most precise mirror ever built, ever ground, but it was precisely wrong. And so the error that was made that led to this problem was the misplacement of a calibration element during one of the tests of the mirror. And because they set the calibration element in the wrong position before they ground the final shape on the mirror, the mirror was precisely ground to a slightly wrong shape, which meant that when it was put in the telescope and in orbit, it had spherical aberration. So, which basically means that the central tight core of each image was surrounded by a diffuse halo that contained some few percent, maybe up to 10% of the total light. It made for pretty ugly images and pretty ugly public relations disaster for NASA. But because the telescope was made precisely wrong, it could be precisely corrected with a pair of essentially eyeglasses. So in the first Hubble servicing mission about three years after launch, um, this was an extremely difficult uh, job. It may have been the hardest of the Hubble servicing missions. Um, the engineers figured out how to insert into the optical path uh, tiny little curved mirrors that would correct, uh, act like eyeglasses, that would correct this perfectly wrong mirror. Now, since the telescope wasn't designed to take these new optical ingredients or elements, that was a really hard thing to do. It was very cramped in there, small space, these positions, these elements, the COSTAR project, that's the acronym of it, had to be placed with the tolerance of a micron, roughly a micron, a millionth of a meter. Um, so it was wonderful precision engineering to correct. It was a very difficult and challenging set of spacewalks by the astronauts on that servicing mission. And when it was put in place, the COSTAR, uh, apparatus, it worked perfectly. And so Hubble's images after CoStar were essentially as good as they were always supposed to be from the beginning of the design. So that was a great success. Now, subsequently, there have been four other servicing missions for Hubble, and, and now CoStar has not been needed for some for decades because as the new instruments were brought on board, um, they, they had the optical correction built into them. So the Hubble's mirror, the Hubble's primary mirror, of course, hasn't changed for almost three almost three, cent, uh, three decades, uh, but all the instruments now just built the correction in, and so they all take perfect images. All right, our next question from a live viewer. Um, it's actually sort of combined two questions. Uh, one is, do aliens exist? And the second one is, how close are we to being able to reliably estimate the Drake equation? So do aliens exist? A very interesting question. So we'll take aliens in this context to mean intelligent entities not like us, life forms that have sentience or self-awareness or intelligence and presumably also technology, but maybe not. They could be aliens who are just, you know, 
smart creatures like some of the creatures we have on the earth like elephants or dolphins or orcas that don't have technology and rockets and spaceships and telescopes um, so do aliens exist probably the raw material the real estate out there is phenomenal there are 10 billion habitable earth-like worlds in the Milky Way galaxy 10 billion and there's been billions of years even before the earth formed for those habitable worlds to develop life and for that life to evolve into something interesting so there's plenty of real estate in space and plenty of real estate in time for aliens to evolve and for some of them to get the technology to leave their planet and start looking around the galaxy or just remote sensing around the galaxy the way we do with telescopes so but that's a hypothetical so there's no reason to say that they don't exist based on those numbers there's actually reason to suspect that they might exist um, where astronomers draw the distinction though is between the likelihood that they could exist and the fact that astronomers don't believe they've actually contacted us or visited because there simply isn't evidence the bar is set very high on evidence. Carl Sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and he was pretty much talking about UFOs and alien visitations, and, and that convincing evidence has not been forthcoming. But yes, they probably do exist. And the second question was about the implication for the Drake equation? Yeah, or, um, how, how well can we um, estimate the Drake equation? The Drake equation is becoming a better known entity as astronomy advances. So the Drake equation is a set of, depending on how it's defined, six or seven factors that multiply together to give you the number of intelligent communicable civilizations at any given time in the Milky Way galaxy. And the first uh, terms of the Drake equation are now measured or determined by astronomy. There's the rate of stars being formed, new stars being formed, how many new stars are there per year in our galaxy? A well-measured number. There is the uh, number of stars or fraction of all those stars that have planets. That's a well-determined number, uh, thanks to 25 years of exoplanet research. And then there's the fraction of those planetary systems uh, where there is an Earth-like planet that's potentially habitable. And that number is pretty close to being measured thanks to the Kepler spacecraft. So those first three terms are all measured now by astronomy. The term that follows is on what fraction of those habitable planets does life actually start or evolve? And that's the one we don't know yet. Um, it could be that there are a lot of habitable planets where life never actually starts. And so that fraction is a very small number, maybe a percent or less than a percent. But it may be almost inevitable that life forms given the ingredients and habitability, in which case that fraction is close to one. We simply don't know. So experiments are going to happen in the next decade to determine that fraction just by looking for microbial life and its alteration of planetary atmospheres on some of the nearest Earth-like planets. So the fourth term in the Drake equation, we plan to measure, astronomers plan to measure it within a decade. That will be very exciting. Terms that follow are even more uncertain, which are what fraction of those planets where life occurred, did life become intelligent? What fraction of those intelligent creatures developed the technology and the wherewithal to communicate in space? And then the final factor, what is their longevity as an intelligent communicable civilization? And, and those three factors are all completely unknown. They're highly speculative. They depend on much as, as much on sociology or anthropology, if you like, except they're aliens and not humans, uh, as they do on astronomy. Okay, so I'm going to try and interpret this question. The viewer can, uh, so this is from Novotny J. Um, they can correct me if I misunderstand it. Um, but I believe the question is, where is the supernova from which all of the atoms in our bodies originated? Was it here before the sun? Are, are the atoms in our body from many supernovas? Where does that? Where did? Where are those supernovas yeah. that our atoms come from? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, first of all, a distinction: N not all the atoms. Well, first of all, a lot of the atoms in our body are are hydrogen, because we're a lot of us is H two O. So we're sort of two thirds water by by weight or by mass, and so there's a lot of hydrogen in our bodies. Now, hydrogen is primordial. That hydrogen came from the Big Bang. Now, the O part of the H2O did come from stars. And so all the heavy elements, the biogenic elements like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and calcium, and sodium, and so on, potassium, 
Um, those are elements that came from stars. Some of those elements came from supernovae, but some also came from giant stars late in their lives um, because massive stars can make heavy elements and then the convection churns those heavy elements to their outer envelopes and they're ejected gently into space. So only a fraction of the elements and perhaps half of the very heavy elements like gold, silver, platinum, and so on came from supernovae. The rest of them came from more gentle fusion processes in massive stars. Um, but of course, the atoms in our bodies um, were part of space that's been churning around. Uh, the sun has been orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. We've been around the Milky Way 18 or 19 times in the time since the Milky Way formed. Uh, the sun's been undulating in and out of the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So there's been a lot of migration and movement. And stars move after they're born and die. So very likely the atoms in our bodies that went through stars or supernovae uh, went through dozens or hundreds of supernovae. It's not even clear how you would estimate how many supernovae the atoms in your body have gone through. But I'm going to guess it's more than dozens. I'm going to guess it's hundreds. So it's a very complex path. And then in recent time, uh, just in the last year or so, very fascinating research uh, showing two things that are new in this picture. One is that a significant fraction of the heavy elements that we're made of, and anyone else who's made of heavy elements, uh, came from merging neutron stars. So this is a discovery just of last year when uh, neutron stars uh, were found merging and they led to gravitational waves, and that's a brand new science. But the issue of how heavy elements get made now has been rewritten a bit to include neutron star mergers. And then the other, maybe even more surprising element, is the people who study how galaxies get created in the universe by mergers of smaller galaxies over cosmic time have deduced that roughly half of the atoms in the Milky Way galaxy came from other galaxies originally. So not only did our atoms come from other stars and other supernovae, uh, many of them, a significant fraction of them, came from supernovae and stars in other galaxies that subsequently merged with the Milky Way. So it's quite an extraordinary story. All right, our next question is from um, Jahan Valdez, uh, who asks, if dark matter and dark energy are out there, shouldn't they also be in our solar system? Uh, yes, absolutely. So if dark energy and dark matter are pervasive ingredients of the universe, if they're fairly smoothly distributed, and the dark energy we think is really smoothly distributed, dark matter is smoothly distributed, but it does have gravity, and so it sort of self-aggregates, um, then yes, they should pervade space, including the space in the solar system. Nobody's figured out any kind of experiment to detect dark energy in the solar system. It's really only measurable on the largest regions of cosmic space by the acceleration of the Hubble expansion. That was how dark energy was discovered in 1995. Dark matter, however, if it's omnipresent in the galaxy, it should indeed exist in the solar system, and we know it roughly what concentration. And so people have been trying to detect uh, dark matter in the Milky Way, in the region of space near the sun, and even in the solar system with very subtle physics experiments that look, try and detect our motion through the dark matter as the sun, as the earth goes around the sun uh, with, with a particular velocity uh, and hope that some part of that velocity will lead to interactions of normal particles in the lab with the dark matter particles that are out there. And that that signal should be modulated on with an annual cycle. So there's a set of quite very difficult experiments that have been done to try and look for this annual modulation of dark matter interactions with normal matter. Um, and, and there was a, there were a couple of claims of this effect, this phenomenon detected in the last few years, and they haven't stood up to scrutiny or further testing. So at the moment, no one's been able to detect dark matter in the solar system in this way. But there are still experiments ongoing, and it's a, it's a very well-motivated thing to do. Hi, um, our next question from Mr. Wanted uh, is, is artificial intelligence being implemented in today's space science research? And if so, how? Uh, absolutely. So AI and machine learning are, you know, they're taking over the world in some ways. And they are present in virtually every field of research and for sure in astronomy. 
I'd say one of the first uses of AI that I became familiar with uh, was with the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope is an extremely valuable resource, very expensive facility. Every year, seven or eight times more proposals are submitted than can possibly get time. And they have to use that resource very efficiently. And it has so many instruments and so many different modes of instruments, and astronomers in a given year are going to want to look at hundreds or thousands of different targets all over the sky with these different instrument modes, that the astronomers quickly figured out that scheduling it by hand or even just using simple algorithms was not going to be successful. I mean, you could do, you could do it, but it would not be optimized and it would be inefficient. And so going back quite a long time, the Hubble Space Telescope has been scheduled by an AI techniques, algorithms that are essentially artificial intelligence inspired and use machine learning to optimize the result. So that's a very early example in astronomy. But astronomy is now using machine learning and artificial intelligence in all sorts of ways. Uh, recognition of galaxies, classification of galaxies. So citizen scientists are familiar with this, where you can, you don't have to be tutored in astrophysics to know the difference between a spiral and an elliptical galaxy. But galaxies are not archetypal, and so many galaxies are confusing looking, seen in different directions. They have dust in them. They're distorted by interactions. They're so faint and smudgy and far away that it's hard to say what they are. And so astronomers have very successfully, been some research papers on this in the last year, they've very successfully used uh, machine learning methods to classify galaxies. And analogous machine learning has been used to classify other things, you know, for visual image classification, whatever it is, galaxies, protein folding, if you're a biologist, uh, AI and machine learning work really well. So yeah, astronomers have adopted um, AI methods quite heavily in their research. Right. Uh, the next question is uh, from Rana Osama, who asks, can you talk about Stephen Hawking's theory about the entropy of black holes? Uh, so Stephen Hawking um, recently lost to us a few months ago when he died, unfortunately, um, did work in the 1970s and into the 80s on the thermodynamics of black holes. Previously, it had been assumed that black holes really only had uh, two properties. They had a mass and a spin because they were formed from a rotating star, so the corpse left behind would be rotating as well. Hypothetically, they could have an electric charge, but most matter is neutral, so it was assumed they wouldn't have any electric charge. But Hawking realized that, like any object in the universe, really, uh, black holes should have a temperature. Uh, and if they have a temperature, then they have an entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. That's a colloquial way of calling it. But more precisely, to a physicist, entropy is the number of equivalent microscopic states. And you can see intuitively that black holes must have a very high entropy because whatever you put in a region of space to become a black hole is lost to you and it all looks the same. So a black hole made of you know, rocks that were crushed together or planets that were smashed together or uh, missing socks, the odd socks you always lose from your drawer all pushed together to make a black hole they all end up looking like the same object with very few properties. So that means that black holes formally have a very high number of indistinguishable microscopic states lying beyond the event horizon, which means that to calculate as a physicist, their entropy is very high. A black hole actually has about 100, a black hole that's the mass of the sun has an entropy 100 million times the entropy of the actual sun. So black holes have a very high entropy, and corresponding to the entropy, they have a temperature. But the temperature is very low because, of course, they're dark. They have no radiation coming out of them, and so the only emission from a black hole is a very feeble Hawking radiation. It was named after Stephen Hawking. And again, that's, a, that's an indication that they have a temperature, an indication that they have entropy. And the Hawking temperature of a normal black hole is billions of a Kelvin, tiny, tiny fraction of a degree that's impossible to measure. So no one can really confirm this central prediction of Hawking's theory yet. All right, a related question. Is that every black hole radiates its mass away as Hawking radiation, what happens to the information contained within it? It can't just go kaboom out of existence because that contradicts quantum theory, right? 
Right, so that's a nice way to ask about the information paradox. So something that became clear around the time Hawking was developing his idea of black hole radiation and thermodynamics was what has become called the information paradox. And that was mm, pretty clearly framed uh, uh, by a physicist called Preskill in the 1980s who worked with Hawking um, and Jacob Bekenstein also in the 1980s. So, so the idea here is, yes, microscopic states are not, so you're not supposed to lose the information of a microscopic quantum state, depending on its situation, whether inside or outside a black hole. Uh, so the question is, what happens to the information that should be preserved in quantum systems as it crosses the event horizon and is lost from view? How is that information just, is that information lost? Is it somehow stored on the event horizon? So speculating about that issue uh, led to all sorts of ideas. One of the ideas is, was the holographic principle that somehow the information is not lost, that somehow as matter approaches the event horizon, at which point it's sort of frozen in time and space, the information is sort of frozen and essentially encoded as like in a barcode on the event horizon of the black hole. So it's not fully lost. Again, impossible to tell with an experiment. So that was one speculation. Because otherwise, as pointed out, eventually the black hole will evaporate and it'll turn back into radiation and radiation is chaotic and has no information content. Photons do not have information content. They cannot store information. Uh, so that information, again, seems to be lost when the black hole evaporates. Uh, and that's just another way of phrasing or framing the information paradox. The information paradox is, is not resolved as we speak. There are There's still very active research going on theoretically on, in what's going on with information in a black hole. All right, uh, the next question is from Julie Stardall who asks, um, what are the current areas of research in astronomy and what do you think will be a relevant area of research in the near future for a potential PhD student? Well, for PhD students just starting, um, there are some active areas, of course. Exoplanets, you know, continues to grow as a subject. Uh, some of the pioneering early discoveries are gone, been and gone. You know, you can't be the first person to find an Earth-like planet or a habitable Earth-like planet. Um, but, and the number of planets has grown to several thousand. But the work continues and the experiments that are being done are are still exciting because we're learning more about these exoplanets that were discovered. So exoplanets is still pretty much the hottest field in astrophysics. Obviously a new field that's just starting is gravitational wave physics. Um, but since not everyone can be a gravitational wave astronomer, so there's only two or three massive projects that hire dozens or <coughs> hundreds of researchers, what's exciting is the what's called multi-messenger astronomy. And that's the fact that when neutron stars merge or merge or neutron star and black hole merge, uh, electromagnetic radiation is produced along with the gravity waves. And that teaches us about the universe and astrophysics in a very interesting way. And so a lot of uh, research is enabled by that. And it doesn't always need a big telescope because when these events happen, they can be very bright in X-rays or optical waves or gamma rays. So multi-messenger astronomy um, associated with gravity wave production is also a very hot area. Uh, deep surveys of galaxies, uh, gravitational lensing, so in extragalactic astronomy, uh, these are still hot fields, as are uh, studies to try and figure out how quasars or active galaxies are fueled or form. We still don't know simple answers about uh, which came first, the massive black hole or the galaxy around the massive black hole? How does the black hole get fueled in the center of a galaxy like ours, which is a very quiet black hole, compared to some other black holes that are extremely active, that are basically the same size and seem to have the same stuff around them to eat? So these are still big unanswered questions. In stellar astronomy, as I mentioned earlier, white dwarfs, red dwarfs, so the coolest stars, the hottest stars are still astrophysics involving those. Star formation is still a big puzzle because it happens in chaotic areas and yet leads to very simple results. Uh, and the rules by which star formation occurs in the universe are not completely understood. So that's a short laundry list of topics that are hot now and are probably gonna stay active for the next decade. All right, um, the next question is from Hazim Faraj who asks, 
Could the near future Parker spacecraft help test or verify general relativity's predictions when it flies 6 million kilometers from the sun during the next few years? So this is an upcoming solar mission. Yeah, um, testing general relativity is an interesting realm of astrophysics because obviously with gravity waves, we've started to be able to test general relativity in what's called the strong field regime of black holes and neutron stars. And that's very exciting because relativity has never been tested that way. But weak field tests of relativity are still uh, important. And the Parker spacecraft is just another way using super precise instruments. So these are, these are physics type experiments that take place in, with spacecraft millions of miles from the Earth that are at precisions of one part in a trillion or, or much less actually. Uh, extraordinarily precise physics experiments. And at that level, uh, in the solar system, you can test general relativity in an unprecedented way. Uh, and so both things are important. I mean, general relativity can be tested with exquisite precision tests of weak gravity, which is to say the gravity we find in the solar system, or with much more basic, even crude uh, data on extremely strong gravity realms like black holes. All right, and the next, and this will be our final question for today, is um, a question kind of about categorizing planets. We categorize exoplanets similar to planets of our own solar system until we understand them better. Right now, we have hot Jupiters and mini Neptunes, and today I heard of hot Saturns. Can you talk about the distinctions between those? Yeah, the typology of exoplanets is has gone in a different direction than the solar system because the solar system has a small set of four rocky terrestrial planets and then a small set of large cold gas giants in the outer solar system. Well, solar systems elsewhere don't follow the same typology. For instance, we found large numbers of super-Earths um, out there. Uh, there are uh, something like a thousand Earth-like planets that have been found in total earth sized using transit methods. And there are an even larger number, like 1,200 or 1,300 super-Earths, so, which is to say up to about two times the size of the Earth. So the out there in the universe, the nearby universe, there are twice as many, there, there's as many super-Earths as Earths, but the solar system has nothing much bigger than the Earth. Venus is essentially the same size. So we don't have a super-Earth in our solar system. We don't have hot Jupiters or hot Saturns in our solar system. And yet out there in space, there are many situations where there are giant planets on very small, tight orbits. Remember, the first exoplanet was a half Jupiter mass planet orbiting its star every four days, which is crazy hot Jupiter. So almost unprecedented, even now after 30 years. That's hard to find anything as extreme as that. Um, so the, the categories of exoplanets are, are very different from the categories in our solar system. And this, as the statistics come in, we're sort of faced with the conclusion that our solar system may not be fully typical of the solar system architectures out there more broadly. And I think within the next five years, when the final Kepler data is reduced, we'll really know what a typical solar system looks like, and it might not be like our solar system at all. So thanks for all your questions today. Uh, I'm on a trip for a couple of weeks, and I think we'll be back in three weeks with another live session. Thank you.